Hi, Julia. Hi, Bob. How are you? I'm pretty good. Good. Let me introduce this. I'm Robert Wright. This is The Wright Show, available on both streaming video and via audio podcast. You are Julia Basha, uh, well-known, I would say even celebrated uh, maker of documentary films. We're going to talk about a film uh, that's going to air on PBS, a film you've made called Nyla and the Uprising. It's going to air this Tuesday. Is that right? That's right. 9 p.m. March 26. Okay. And uh, you've, um, you know, it's a really interesting film. Uh, it, it, it tells a story that's worth telling in its own right, which is kind of the early stages of the Palestinian resistance, in particular the first intifada in the late 80s. But it um, adds a couple of things to the story. First of all, you humanize it by focusing on a particular family. But second, you call attention to something that I don't think has been called attention to much, which is the role of women in the, in the Intifada, the role that women played. In fact, this is part of a, uh, there are several documentaries airing on PBS this week and next week under the rubric, I think, what is it, uh, Women, War and Peace or something like that? That's right. It's the second edition of Women, War and Peace. Uh, which is a WNET and Fork Films production. Uh -huh. um, it tells the stories of women in conflict areas around the world and really kind of writes women back into the history of these uh, conflicts. Okay. And so that'll be uh, Tuesday, March 26th. Before we start talking about this story, why don't we talk a little about some of your earlier work because some of it's pretty closely related. Uh, mm -hmm. Much of it, has to do with the Middle East. I guess you kind of got your start by your co-writer on the documentary Control Room, which I remember well. Uh, it was a kind of a view of the Iraq war from the perspective of Al Jazeera, you might say. And, yeah. and, and then you did um, a couple of things relevant to Israel-Palestine. You, uh, I think, were the director of both Boudreaux and, what is it, My Neighborhood or Our Neighborhood or yeah, my neighborhood. My neighborhood, and also Counterpoint, which was the first one. Okay, so I've seen Boudris and uh, and my neighborhood. In fact, I had Muhammad, the star of my neighborhood, was on my show. He was, he came over. He spent a weekend, this past weekend, here in New York with me. Really, I was going to ask because he was a boy at that point, a young boy. It was a story about how his family's home in East Jerusalem had been partly occupied by settlers with the full legal authority of the Israeli government. Settlers kind of took over part of the house. And um, I forget how old he is, was when I talked to him, but, but what's he up to now? He should be in his 20s now? He's turning 21 in two months. Uh -huh. uh, he got a full scholarship to go to school in Atlanta. Uh, he's an incredible uh, writer. He's been writing a lot of poetry and doing spoken word uh, presentations across campuses in the United States. So he's been touring around. He talks a lot about his own experience growing up um, in East Jerusalem uh, in, a, in a neighborhood that is really at the heart of the attempt to displace Palestinians from Jerusalem uh, by, you know, a sort of concerted effort between the settler movement and the Israeli government. And so, as you as you said, you know, he he was the protagonist in our film uh, when he was 12 years old. And so he really kind of lived through both enormous amount of trauma, but also kind of finding uh, cooperation with Israeli activists and building a movement to try to stop uh, the displacement of his family from his house. Yeah, it was a very, uh, it was a very powerful film. And then uh, Boudreaux, which I saw in a theater in New York, was... In some ways, an uplifting film. I mean, it was about a Palestinian village that rose up um, to protest Israeli plans to build a wall that was going to run kind of through the property of the village. So they were going to get cut off from farmland. Um, you know, one thing that's a recurring theme in, in your films, it seems to me, is that there typically are Israelis who are helping out in one way or another, who are helping, helping the Palestinians out. They're, they're sympathetic Israelis. And as we'll discuss, there, there's there's a version of that in uh, in in the in the current film in Nyla and the Uprising. 
Yeah, I mean, I've been uh, for the past 15 years. So after I made Control Room, which was about, as you mentioned, the Iraq war, I joined an organization called Just Vision. And uh, Just Vision is a nonprofit organization, and we tell the stories of Palestinian-led and Israeli-supported nonviolent resistance to the occupation. And those movements, as you mentioned, tend to include uh, both Palestinians in their leadership of these movements, but also Israeli supporters who actually believe that their future is tied in with the freedom of the Palestinian population and who join in in this variety of movements. So my neighborhood is at the neighborhood level in Sheikh Jarrah, which is uh, in East Jerusalem. Budrus is in a village in the West Bank. And then our last film, Nile and the Uprising, goes much larger, which is a nationwide uprising mm -hmm. that people, um, you know, generally remember um, as maybe, you know, a bunch of boys throwing stones at um, uh, Israeli jeeps, uh, but really was an incredibly well orchestrated discipline movement that lasted for four years and that was in its majority made up of nonviolent activities. Yeah. Okay. And so before we get further into that, you want to tell us a little about yourself. How did you get interested in the Middle East? You are from Brazil, right? That's right. So I was born and raised in Rio de Janeiro in Brazil. Uh, I came to the U.S. Uh, originally to study English for one year when I was 17 years old and ended up staying here and doing my undergraduate at Columbia University. While I was uh, at Columbia, September 11 happened. And when the attacks uh, took place uh, in the World Trade Center, that kind of really changed uh, my perspective in the world and my placing in the world. I always thought of myself as someone who would go back to Brazil and work on social justice issues there. But um, the, the tragedy of that day uh, really shook uh, the reality of anybody who was in New York City and really in the United States. I think my generation, I think, uh, both people who were born in the United States and also uh, immigrants um, have been shaped by that and also by the Iraq war. And uh, I certainly um, was heavily influenced uh, by that to become interested in the Middle East. Mm -hmm. And after I graduated from school, I moved to Egypt and I lived there and made control room uh, there with the director, Jehan Nujem, who is Egyptian American. Mm -hmm. And shortly after that, uh, an Israeli human rights advocate called Ronit Avni, who had seen Control Room, contacted me to help her make a film in the region. And at that time, she was beginning to uh, build the organization that became Just Vision. Okay. And together with her and other team members uh, on the ground, we, we started researching, documenting, and disseminating these stories of Palestinians and Israelis who had gone basically undocumented by the vast majority of media worldwide. Okay. So the story of Nyla, the woman who is at the center of your new film, kind of begins when she is a child. I don't know exactly how old she was when the, um, when the Six Day War happened and Israel uh, came to occupy the West Bank, Gaza, and East Jerusalem. But this affected her profoundly uh, because for one thing her house was was it demolished when she was a child by Israeli troops yes do, do we know why wh what why they did that so nobody knows exactly why they did it you know there is no due process um, on the actions that the Israeli military does in the West Bank there's no rule of law so the demolitions happen without any explanation, without the ability to to, to demand uh, reparations. There, there's no no actual rule of law for Palestinians in the West Bank. So they basically came. Uh, they demolished the home without uh, warning. Uh, she, as you know, we, we depict in the film, she heard the noise when she was in the yard at her school with her four other sisters. And um, the school uh, principal got very nervous and concerned about the safety of the kids, sent people to learn what had happened, and someone came running back saying that her father's home had been demolished. Um, and, uh, and that was a, 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 you know, a very traumatic um, moment for an eight-year-old girl. Um, and it was, you know, as a child, her first experience and her first um, exposure to um, the fact that um, her family, her community, the Palestinians at large, were really living at the mercy of a military occupation. Okay. Now, 
I, I get the idea that this experience has something to do with the fact that she joined the resistance, so to speak. I'm not even sure when there came to be a resistance. Now, by 19, the, by the late 1980s, I was actually in Israel during the first Intifada for a couple of weeks in November of um, 88, I guess. Um, by that time, I mean, that was almost the first kind of, you might say, nationwide organized resistance, was it, the, the, the first Intifada? Yeah, I would say it was the first grassroots uprising from inside the territories, right, from inside Gaza and the West Bank. I think up until then, uh, there was a lot of organized resistance in the diaspora and by the refugees. Uh, so obviously people, you know, not, not everybody, not obviously, but many people will remember that their first exposure to resistance is from the Palestinian Liberation Organization and the, the sort of figure of Arafat. And all of that resistance always happened outside of mm -hmm. Gaza, the West Bank, and East Jerusalem. And the first Intifada marks the first time that leadership on the ground says, we are now going to take responsibility over achieving our freedom. And we're no longer going to take all of our orders from the outside. Now, there was communication and there was interaction between the PLO, which at that point was in Tunisia, after having been kicked out of Jordan and then kicked out of Lebanon and then sent to Tunisia, there was actually communication between the PLO and Tunisia and these local leaders. But really, at the heart, the people on the ground were calling the shots. Okay. Now, um, so she becomes, I, I guess a, a, a key event is she studies, she goes to study abroad. She meets the man who becomes her husband, also a Palestinian. They come back to the West Bank, become active in the resistance. Do you have a sense for when um, her, her, her decision to become a member of the resistance kind of solidified? And does she herself, by the way, I, and this may be in the film, I may have forgotten, but does she talk about the connection between her home being demolished and her determination to participate in the resistance? Yeah, she definitely talks about how that moment was was kind of seeded her, was the first moment of seeding her commitment to uh, struggling against the occupation. And um, her going to Bulgaria is the moment, where she, so she goes and she gets a scholarship uh, to go study uh, in Bulgaria, which was a common thing at the time. So this is the 80s, this is a still time, still a time where the Soviet Union still played a role in um, kind of supporting and financially providing scholarships for some people to go study in countries in Eastern Europe. And she's one of many Palestinians who, who get to do that. And um, there was a community of Palestinians from all over uh, the Middle East that she gets to meet. So for the first time, uh, she meets Palestinians who are refugees in Lebanon, Lebanon, who are also studying Bulgaria, Palestinians who are in Jordan, in the diaspora, Palestinians who are in Egypt. So she actually connects with this broader world of, um, of uh, Palestinian um, activism and meets Jamal Zakut, who is already at that point uh, uh, the head of the student union at the university mm -hmm. and playing a very active um, political uh, role. And... Um, and that kind of becomes a big part of her identity uh, so that by the time she comes back and, uh, you know, encounters a, a, a sort of a, a fledgling women's movement on the ground and, and kind of uh, already the seeds for um, a potential uprising, she, she really finds her niche uh, when she returns. Now, she, she gets arrested and undergoes a, a true trauma um, while in prison. Do you want to talk about that? And, and do, do we know why she was, I mean, I guess the Israelis, this is after she comes back to West Bank, I guess the Israelis had gotten a sense that she was part of the resistance. I guess, broadly speaking, that's why uh, she was arrested. Do we have a more specific idea of, of what the grounds were? So um, what happens to Nyla is what was happening to many women and men at the time that uh, were beginning to organize at the grassroots level. And um, it was completely illegal uh, to have any affiliation with, let's say, a union, right? So union organizers at the time uh, were, were arrested. Uh, if you were a member of a student uh, group, 
you could be arrested. So Palestinians weren't allowed to actually congregate in groups and organize even if um, it wasn't um, kind of explicitly political. Mm -hmm. And um, and so there were a lot of arrests happening of, of people like Nyla. Uh, she had not herself been involved on any major actions. Uh, she was participating on a lot of grassroots organizing, which was taking place at the time. And that was um, kind of coordinated through the political parties. So during that time, um, the sort of PLO uh, parties were all illegal um, and were considered terrorist organizations. So DFLP, the PFLP, Fatah, um, the Communist Party. So if you had any participation with uh, women's groups, for example, that were affiliated with these political parties, mm -hmm. your women's group was therefore considered a terrorist organization, even though the women's group wasn't actually involved on any violence whatsoever. Um, and Nyla was associated with women's groups that were affiliated with the DFLP. And, Which stands uh, for, I guess, the, the Liberation of Palestine accounts for the LP. What is the D oh, uh, the Democratic Front? So the Democratic, yeah. So the DFLP is the Democratic Front for the Liberation of Palestine. Mm -hmm. And uh, she was involved in women's groups activities, which was there was a, a, a sort of a very widespread feminist uh, organizing taking place, um, partly made possible because of the influence of socialist ideology in a lot of these parties which actually believe that women and men are equal, as opposed to what we see today on the influence of Islamist ideology on political organizing. And so the women that belong to these women's groups uh, actually had a lot of say in what went on and how they organized themselves and what they um, wanted to ask for. And so she was, um, uh, you know, sort of kidnapped in the middle of the night from her home uh, without any warning and um, was tortured. And even though she had appealed to the uh, interrogators saying that she was pregnant at a time. Because by now she is, she is married, right? By now she's married. Uh, she gets pregnant and uh, she ends up um, having a miscarriage while in prison and for a long time refused medical care for that miscarriage and left to bleed for many days. She was prison. refused medical care. She was refused medical care. What she was told was that she would only get medical care if she confessed to be a member of the DFLP. Uh -huh. So now there were at this point some uh, sympathetic Israeli journalists who called attention to this, right? Exactly. So what happens is that after um, days of not knowing where his wife was, Jamal Zakut, who is Nyla's husband, uh, decides to contact an Israeli journalist that he knows uh, because she's also has already been active on left wing politics. So during the first intifada, there were um, uh, relationships built between left wing parties that also associated with socialist ideology in Israel and the socialist parties in Palestine because they saw that they had a common ground around workers' rights, around women's equality, uh, around ideologies that went way uh, like beyond a nationalist identity. And uh, this journalist that um, Jamal got in touch with was one of these people and she immediately found a way to break the story on mainstream uh, Israeli media. And when that story was broke, uh, Nyla was released and got medical care. Yeah. Um, so then she, um, so she, she's then, I guess, kind of briefly reunited with her husband. I mean, she is released from prison, but then at some point he gets deported, right? Correct. So she gets released from prison um, a few months before the outbreak of the first intifada. Um, and at that point... And that's in 1987 or...? Right, December 1987. Okay. So, so she, her, her arrest and miscarriage uh, and torture takes place in February. And by the end of that year, she, the, the first intifada breaks out. And um, when that happens... Jamal Zakut uh, is one of the sort of key persons together with other members of other of, of the other PLO political parties who drafts the first leaflet calling for that uprising. 
And in that leaflet, they kind of set out um, the strategies and they talk very explicitly that this is going to be about civil disobedience, about strikes, about um, sit-ins, about marches, um, about boycotting of Israeli products. And, um, and he is therefore quickly uh, arrested and deported alongside the other key original uh, members who drafted it. And we should emphasize this was fundamentally a peaceful uprising. I mean, you know, teenage boys threw rocks at, at Israelis with submachine guns, but there's only so far you can get with rocks when they've got submachine guns. So it was, I mean, look, if I was a soldier, I guess I wouldn't welcome it. But the point is people shouldn't confuse this with the second intifada uh, more than a decade later when there were suicide bombings and so on. In fact, you know, when I, uh, this was the first time I've been to Israel, and things were so low key there. I mean, such a contrast with the situation today that I remember, you know, we were staying in, okay, so I guess by that time we were in Jerusalem, and we said, well, let's go to Bethlehem, my wife and I. Got up, drove to Bethlehem. I honestly did not even realize until after I got back that I had been in the West Bank. I mean, the Bethlehem is in the West Bank. I mean, there, there was, yeah, there was a place where there was a stop. You stopped, some soldiers looked at you and they saw that, you know, you didn't, you seemed pretty innocuous and you, and you went along, but there was no border wall. Um, the uprising itself, I mean, I remember that you, the shops were closed in Bethlehem in keeping with, um, you know, the, the, the kind of rules of the Intifada, but it was a relatively low key thing. Um, but still, uh, I, I guess it was uh, Israel tried very hard to stop it. Yeah, there was an enormous amount of violence used. You know, this is the time that uh, Rabin was the defense minister and he uh, imposed the break their bones policy, which was the intentional goal was to beat people until you actually broke their legs. Uh, there was live ammunition used freely during these demonstrations. Uh, many of these demonstrations, there were not even rocks involved. Many of them had, but some didn't. And regardless, there was significant violence used against uh, a civilian population. Um, and, you know, when we talk about um, what actually took place and what kind of tactics were being used, uh, this was recognized by the Israeli army at the time. So the Israeli army issued a report during the First Intifada where it said that 97% of activities were unarmed during that uprising. Uh, so this was widely recognized as a grassroots protest movement um, for uh, equality and for freedom of a population that had been at that point living under military occupation for 20 years. Mm -hmm. Okay, so talk about what women did during the Intifada. And to what extent was, it, um, was their role kind of encouraged by the fact that were, were quite a few males deported as Nyla's husband was? Was that one thing that went on? Absolutely. So uh, when the first intifada broke out, the Israeli army wanted to try to swiftly end it and crack it down as uh, effectively as possible. So there was massive uh, arrests. Uh, many Palestinians were deported. And the way that those deportations took place at the time is that um, again, without any due process, uh, these men would be put inside helicopters. Uh, the helicopters would fly out and land on no man's land in Lebanon. So on areas that uh, were still uh, undeclared uh, who was actually in control between Israel and Lebanon. And they would just be pushed out of the helicopter, not, not from the air, landed, taken, sent out from the helicopter and the helicopter would take off and they would be left on no man's land. This was how these, these men were being deported. Um, there was actual like no conversation around where they're going, who's taking care of them, and they were left to kind of uh, figure out on their own. Um, there was also thousands of men who were put into these makeshift uh, jails in the desert uh, of Israel. Uh, so because they had so many men, they didn't have jail space. So they had created this like open air, like jails, uh, in the desert where they would just basically gather, you know, men of a certain age. Like if you were between, you know, 14 or 27 and you were a male Palestinian, 
uh, and in the streets at a, at a, you know, inconvenient hour, you were swept up and put inside a jail. So they were doing all of that to try to stop it. What they didn't expect was that there was a well-organized and networked group of women who were ready to take the place of every one of these men who get taken out. And these women had already training and were organized because they belonged to women's organizations affiliated with the political parties. So whereas they were doing things outwardly like you know, doing workshops in villages to teach women how to begin to operate a business or to learn how to sew properly, kind of like women's empowerment and development type of work. Uh, what they were actually doing was political organizing. They were kind of creating political power mm -hmm. and relationships. Uh, and when the vacuum was created, because so many men had disappeared, they were ready to take over. Mm -hmm. And uh, the fact that that ended up happening was one of the big reasons why the movement actually was able to last and be disciplined for so long because the women had in their intention a vision for what the movement would be about. Um, and they didn't want just national liberation. They wanted women's liberation inside Palestinian society. So it was a time of tremendous gender equality in Palestinian society where women actually found spaces to do things that they had never been able to do before and they haven't been able to do since. Um, and that story has been largely ignored and largely buried, um, both obviously internationally, very few people know about this, but, but even inside Palestinian society today, uh, the new generation uh, knows very little about the role that women played during that time. Okay, and now did, did the fact that they were women kind of help them conceal their activities better than might have been you know, I almost got this idea of women kind of like pretending to have quilting parties or something when in fact they're they're staging resistance. You know, I mean, did did was it did this kind of make it harder for the Israeli authorities? I think they certainly benefited from the stereotypes that the Israeli mm -hmm. army had about the role of women in Arab societies. Uh, I think they believe that women's place was in the kitchen and that the men would never have allowed them uh, or permitted them to kind of take a more active role on the streets to do dangerous things. Um, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, that stereotypical vision of Muslim Arab women, uh, played in the favor of women at that time because they were able to organize with more freedom than the men. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there was a funny moment where uh, one of Nyla's compatriots, a woman who um, I, I don't remember her name, but 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 she says that they would say like um, they would say to people about some 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 initiative the resistance was thinking about taking. They'd say to people, "Okay, well we'll go check with the men and see if we can get permission." But we didn't check with the men. We didn't, you know we just came back and said, "Okay, you got a green light." Exactly. So Rabi Hadiab, who is the person who says that line, she was actually the head of Fatah locally. Oh, was she? Uh, the president's father, which is extraordinary. Fatah was a huge organization at the time. It's the biggest uh, faction inside the PLO. Uh, carries enormous political influence. Uh, and at one point, she became the head of Fatah. And um, people, as you said, would come to her and be like, okay, so there's this, there's that, da, da, da. And, and she had to conceal that actually she was the ultimate decision maker because she had to, because otherwise people might feel that the Intifada was leader, leaderless and falling apart. And so she would actually tell them, okay, I will consult with the brothers is what she would say. Mm -hmm. and, and then just make a decision and then let people know. Mm -hmm. Okay. And so the, the first Intifada, well, actually, I mean, we should say, we should get back to the personal story because Nyla at this point, uh, at some point has a, has a tough decision. They have, after the miscarriage, they have a son, but now the son's father has been deported. And so talk about that. Yeah. So, um, after, uh, so actually I think the day of, or the day after, I can't remember exactly now, uh, that Jamal gets arrested and then is deported is the day that Nyla goes into uh, birth, like oh. starts delivering um, the baby, Majd Zakut. And obviously this is a really difficult time. You know, this is, this is a, a, a woman and a couple who had an incredibly traumatic experience with her first pregnancy 
uh, going, being tortured and uh, losing her baby. And now she is giving birth to the second baby uh, at the same time that her, the future of her husband is completely unknown. She doesn't know if he's dead or what they're going to do to him. Um, and Jamal is eventually deported, uh, and she now is raising um, a newborn baby on her own uh, in Gaza and still very active in the grassroots organizing of the Intifada. Um, she is six months later, so when her baby is six months, still breastfeeding uh, and still incredibly vulnerable, she is arrested again in the middle of the night and forcefully taken from her baby and put in prison. Um, and there is a movement that starts building again with Israeli press participation to try to get her free so she can take care of her newborn baby who is now sick because his, his, his breastfeeding was interrupted abruptly and this kid is not actually being properly fed. Um, the army refuses to let her out, but they let the baby in. So they say, okay, the baby can go into prison with Nyla. And he becomes the youngest Palestinian prisoner in an Israeli jail. Mm -hmm. And what happens at that moment, though, is, is a really, like, um, I think, symbolic moment of what the Intifada was like for women. Because Nyla is in a political prisoner's jail for female political activists. And there are dozens of other women who are also mothers whose kids are also outside and whom they are incredibly worried about at the same time they're in prison. And all of these women start taking care of Majd, of Nyla's son, as if they are their own child. And um, that is the sort of, uh, I think, spirit of, uh, for these women who participated in this uprising. This is what they talk the most about. When we interviewed, when we interviewed dozens of women from all different social classes and political backgrounds and geographical locations. And what they talk about was this amazing solidarity that existed among the women and this belief that this was a huge um, crisis in their lives, but it was also an opportunity to build the communities and to build the societies with the values of pluralism and equality and justice that they wanted to see in Palestinian society. Mm -hmm. So, um, so then, <clears throat> excuse me. So finally, she joins her husband abroad. He's in Cairo. That's right. Yeah. So she's left with the decision. So right. So then she's let out after six months because she's put in what's called an administrative detention, which is something that exists till this day in mm -hmm. Israel. Administrative detention is when you arrest someone and you don't need to charge them with anything. You're just putting them in prison for six months. Let's just put them away for six months without charging them with anything. We're not even going to tell them what the heck is going on. And they can renew the, administra the administrative detention. So they can say, when the six months is over, let's keep them in for another six months. But again, no charges. Uh, so she was put under this category. After six months, she's actually let out. They don't renew her detention, probably because there's a baby involved. And she gets out. Uh, and she's now desperately wanting to connect with her husband. She's just been against re-traumatized by being in prison with a newborn baby who hasn't never met the father. And she tries to get authorization from the Israeli government to be able to go visit. And the Israeli government says, yes, you can go visit if you sign this piece of paper that you won't come back for two years. Now, what those papers actually are meant to do and, and, and what they did several times is that people sign these agreements and then they're actually never allowed back. Two years pass as they try to come in back in and they're never allowed in back into the country. So she's terrified about signing this agreement. This is something that has happened to other family members of hers that they haven't been allowed back. But after months of trying to figure out another way, she decides she has to go. And, and so she goes and goes to Cairo. Um, and she's, she's there. The Intifada is continuing. And soon thereafter, uh, the Intifada starts to bear fruits. Uh, and by that, so it this means is that, what, what yeah. year does she go to Cairo? So she goes to Cairo in like eight, uh, 89 or 89 90. Or 90. Nine. Okay. Yeah, no, I'm, no, so I'm the Intifada sorry. has been underway for, for a few years, two or three years. Yeah. Um, and, and okay, and, and the fruit it bears is what? So the fruit it bears is that it creates a political environment internationally, and particularly in the United States, mm 
where pressure starts to bear on Israel to negotiate with the Palestinians for statehood for Palestinians, right? So um, George Bush Sr. is in power here, and he does something that no president had done before him and no president in the United States has done since him, which is that he withholds what are called loan guarantees, which is one of the forms of financial aid that the United States provides to Israel. He withholds those loan guarantees until and unless Israel stops its settlement constructions in the West Bank. Mm -hmm. And so actually creating financial incentives for Israel to stop violation, violation of international law. Right. So since um, 1967, Israel has been building settlements, which right now look like entire cities with universities and, you know, now third generation Jewish Israeli people living inside what is considered um, Palestinian territory. Yeah, you have to go there to appreciate how systematic the encroachment is and how it it kind of wraps the Palestinian villages in this like web you know, there are these roads that 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 the Palestinians are by and large not allowed to drive on. Only settlers are. And that complicates their attempt to get from one from point A to point B. And it is it has kind of just grown and grown and grown under every single uh, prime minister, even the relatively liberal ones. Um, and you're right. Bush was the last. I mean, in a lot of ways, people underappreciate some things to be that I think are to be appreciated about the first George Bush's foreign policy, but he certainly was uh, unusual in the extent to which he was willing to give Israel some tough love. That's right. And, and so what that created was uh, pressure on Israel to agree to sit down with Palestinians for the first time, right? So up until then, all efforts at negotiations were done through Jordanians or Egyptians. Palestinians were not recognized as a nationality that needed to be negotiated with directly. Uh, you know, up until then, there were, you know, really significant sections of the Israeli uh, political leadership and population that believed that uh, there's no such a thing as a Palestinian. They're just Arabs. And we can resolve this problem by sending them to Jordan. Uh, because they're just Arabs, just like the Jordanians, right? So this, the first intifada creates for the first time the recognition of the Palestinian national identity. And so it's a huge, uh, um, a huge moment for the recognition of a population, uh, and, and actually allowing them to sit down and negotiate their future for the first time with their occupiers. Um, and the first, uh, version of this long negotiation process, uh, was the conference in Madrid. And at that conference, many Palestinian women uh, were participating as part of the delegation. In fact, the Palestinian delegation was the one that had uh, the most, the greatest representation of women. Um, and um, and the the negotiations that then went, you know, from Madrid, Southern Madrid, and when Washington won, and Washington two, you know, all of these processes that started were actually. Um, really grounded on the reality that Palestinians were leaving because people from the ground, people who actually lived in Ramallah, who lived in Gaza City, who were actually part of the communities there, were the ones during doing the negotiation of the, their future. Uh, unfortunately, what happened was that that process that could have generated real uh, freedom and real justice and potentially real peace to the Middle East got interrupted by an underground and secret negotiation that came to be known as the Oslo Accords. And the Oslo Accords were done um, by the Israeli government contacting the PLO leadership in Tunisia. So again, this goes back to this is Arafat, who has not been inside the West Bank or Gaza for decades. Although his, his political party was represented, you, you, we mentioned a woman who was head of the local chapter of Fatah, and that's his party, right? Absolutely. The parties are all represented, right? So the, the parties that exist inside the West Bank and Gaza are an exact mirror of the PLO parties that exist in Tunisia. But, what, but was, there, was there kind of some a little tension between the, 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 the versions in Palestine and the, and the version... Uh, the, the Fatah leadership in, in Tunisia? 
Yeah, it was a complex relationship, right? There was both um, a lot of uh, coordination and a lot of um, communication, but there was also a lot of kind of pushback and the local leadership really wanting to be able to to make some of the decisions around the strategy of the movement. And certainly at that negotiation moment is a rupture. That's the moment when Arafat and, and his group uh, in Tunisia um, decide to take over the negotiations and they do so secretly. They do not inform the Palestinians from their own parties that are negotiating actively and in good faith with Israelis in the, in these other negotiations processes and they start a completely, um, um, separate process via, with, via Norway, right? But, but, via Norway. but with Israel and presumably with the, with the knowledge of the United States. No, not until it was revealed. Really? Now that's that's so that is fascinating. That so the yeah. the Palestinians, the, the the people who had really driven the Intifada, had gotten to a point where they had the U.S. actually playing a constructive role for just about the last time, with all due respect for all subsequent U.S. presidents, mm -hmm. um, and uh, and they they think they're negotiating with the Israelis. Meanwhile, the Israelis are negotiating separately with Arafat uh, via Norway. And Norway's not telling the U.S. what it's doing, and Israel's not telling the U.S. what it's doing. It was a completely secret negotiation. Uh, the, the people like Zahira Kamal, who was in Madrid and was participating in the Washington negotiations, she learned about it in the media. She learned about it on television for the first time. And, and so what did so what did what did Israel kind of get by virtue of negotiating with Arafat instead of the people actually living in Palestine? Why was that a, pre a preferable deal? They got a counterpart in the PLO that was eager first and foremost to reassert their political power and reassert their position as the legitimate representatives of the Palestinian population, as opposed to a negotiating partner, which they had in Washington, the Washington negotiations, that were actually there to negotiate freedom and independence for the Palestinians. So what, what happened, Oslo, isn't a peace agreement, isn't a freedom agreement, it's a security arrangement. So what they arranged there was that Arafat and the PLO would be allowed to return for the first time in decades, right? These are people who haven't lived in the region for the vast majority of their lives. And they are put in power, and they are granted that power by the occupying force, Israel. And the PLO, Arafat, guarantees to Israel that it will now be the security force. It will control the Palestinian people and will uh, guarantee that there won't be uh, disruptions. Mm -hmm. And that's the arrangement. It's a security arrangement. If you actually look at what was um, promised other than that, what was negotiated for real other than that, it's all, it's all like that will be negotiated in the future. Borders to be discussed. Jerusalem to be discussed. Refugees to be discussed. No decisions are made about anything of, of, of that actually are of significance to the Palestinian population and why they created that uprising and, and made huge sacrifices for it. Right. And uh, so on the one hand, you can say, well, look, we're, we're, we're giving you a kind of autonomy in the sense that you will be ruled by Palestinians, not by Israelis. But of course, the Israelis are ultimately in control. Their soldiers can enter any part of the West Bank, for example, anytime they want, if they're not satisfied with the performance of the um, security forces. And uh, in any event, so, so the Oslo Accords don't bear the fruit that might some might have hoped. One thing that happens is uh, Rabin gets assassinated, right? The, uh, the prime minister of Israel by a settler, by a hardcore settler who doesn't like the idea of accords generally, probably. That ultimately ushers in Bibi Netanyahu. And more or less, you could say the rest is history, I guess. Uh, but I'm sure I'm missing something. So why don't you go in any details that you think? Are no, I mean, certainly, I think I think that that. I think we are right now entering, I think, finally the post-Oslo period. I think you're right that, like, basically everything that we have lived up until the last few years were just the sort of, like, living the the sort of, um, like, reverberations and, and expectations that somehow we're still going to figure out Oslo, right? 
It's like, well, no, let's, let's keep negotiating. Like, okay, peace agreement again. Let's get them together to, to figure out all these other things that Oslo never actually negotiated. What were the like, okay, so now let's try to discuss borders. Let's, and none of that ever happened, right? Like the settlement constructions continue at an ever faster pace after Oslo. So Palestinians actually lose more and more land uh, after they actually made a peace agreement. Um, so they are left in a much worse position than before. Uh, the first intifada. I think what we see now is um, the beginning, at least for a large portion of the Palestinian population, and I think we're beginning to see some understanding of that on the American leader, political leadership, that that version of negotiations, the idea that we are just kind of following up from Oslo, is is over. It's completely dead. And we need to completely rethink how we are organizing this. And for many Palestinians, particularly young Palestinians, they look at the West Bank and they cannot fathom how that's going to become a state. Mm -hmm. Because as you mentioned, the place is completely cut up, huge cities uh, of, you know, Jewish only settlers can live and enter with roads that connect them directly to the airport that they cannot even consider dream going in those roads that are the actually like super fast highways uh, very well taken care of. You know, there's an entire infrastructure that is first world infrastructure inside the West Bank, and they are living in this, in, in, at, in the kind of like remaining, you know, lines outside it. And the idea that they're, that these settlers are somehow going to get evacuated is unrealistic. And at this point, it would be like a huge humanitarian crisis to actually like try to lift up 500,000 people mm -hmm. from this. So, I think many Palestinians today, particularly as I said, the younger generation are saying, you know what? We tried getting a state of our own. That didn't work. So right now, I just want citizenship in what is de facto one state. And they're turning their movements into a civil rights movement. Now, which are they? Because I've long thought that it would be extremely powerful for Palestinians to march and say, all we're asking for is the right to vote, the same right that the Jewish settlers who live 300 yards away have, and we don't think it should be denied us on the basis of our ethnicity. After all, the Israeli government ultimately rules us. It says it's a democracy and so on. I've always thought peaceful mm -hmm. marches uh, would be so powerful uh, and put so much pressure on Israel internationally that Israel might, for one thing, offer a two-state deal better than anything they've offered by a long shot, uh, although it may well be too late, too late for to say deal. But my question is, um, whenever I brought that up, including when I brought it up in the West Bank, yeah. th there have been reasons they didn't want to go that route. And, and there have been various reasons, and I needn't get into them, but is your sense that that, that actual tactic may be, uh, may be picking up steam? Because I'm not, I, I haven't really noticed if it has. Totally. I think it certainly has with younger crowd, not, not with the old generation. I think the, the, the sort of people who were part of the original creation of the notion that we are fighting for a national movement, right? Of, of sort of a self-determination of our state mm -hmm, and mm -hmm. kind of created that vision for what the struggle is are still very much attached to it. The generation that wasn't part of that are actually just looking at the reality and are finding that the civil rights direction is probably the best way of getting somewhere. And it actually fits better with that generation's um, broader values, right? Of actually like wanting to live in equality with everybody, not believing in national boundaries, you know, wow. like all of those things that are, but, but I don't want to overstate in terms of like, um, this being the majority of the Palestinian population. I don't right. think we're there yet. But I definitely think that the more organized groups uh, that that are kind of taking on actions that, by the way, are getting crushed by the Palestinian Authority, right? So, right. you know, the Palestinian Authority, which was created in the Oslo Accords, continue to play the role of the security forces. And that's the money that, you know, keeps flowing, right? Like, this is the support that like Israel is terrified that the United States, you know, because the United States has now cut off all kind of support. Israel right, is it's terrified. Like Trump is so clueless. <laughs> Trump is so clueless. He's like, okay, we're not going to give any money to the Palestinians. And Israel's like, you don't understand. This is the way we control exactly. the people who have the guns. And yeah. 
I mean, it's crazy. I, I, yeah, I, I, it's a very, it's a, it's a really bizarre situation where Israel is like moderate your stance. Yeah, right. Um, and uh, and so and you know I think one of the the things that does make this moment more challenging for Palestinian activism and for the movement is figuring out how do you position yourself vis-a-vis -vis the Palestinian Authority. Right. And there are people who believe and Abbas has several times threatened to dismantle the PA and return the responsibility of the territories to Israel, mm -hmm. as you had before the first Intifada, which creates just a much more direct, actual um, recognition of what the real situation is and financial responsibility, because the PA has been the financial responsibility of the international community now. Right. Donors, European donors, the United States you know, gives millions of dollars every year to prop up and, and, and therefore Israel only, ha only has financial benefits from being able to exploit natural resources in the West Bank and no financial responsibility for having to manage and collect the garbage of Palestinians. So there's a huge, like the, the, the incentive structure is, is completely, um, wrapped, warped now. Mm -hmm. So, um, what kind of vibe did you get from the women you talk to now, right? I mean, as you said, I, I assume you mean to include them when you say the older generation is still thinking in terms of two-state solution or, you know, Palestinian national state. And yet, that just seems so remote right now. And not only because of the Trump administration, which makes it completely remote, but because, as we've said, it's getting kind of harder to, uh, I don't know, unscramble the omelet or whatever the metaphor would be. The, the, the intertwining of Jewish settlements and, uh, you, you, you know, it, it's so thoroughly ingrained. The, the settlements are so thoroughly ingrained in the West Bank. Are they, are they still hopeful? Are these women still hopeful for a two-state solution or what? I don't know that it's necessarily hopeful, but I do think that they believe that it is – uh, the responsibility of Israel to figure out how to handle its settlers, right? I think that's the kind of like, this was done illegally. You have transferred your population into occupied territory, which is a huge violation of international law. And therefore, you have to figure out how to, you know, solve that problem. Uh, and we are here waiting for you to, you know, figure it out. Um, I think that it's much harder for people who have... Uh, both a, 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 an ideological and an identity attachment to a vision of liberation, but also um, uh, who, you know, really see, which I, which I agree, how difficult it will be for Israel to actually accept the notion of giving full civil rights and full citizenship to all of the Palestinian population because they have it has taken them so long to get the recognition of their identity, their separate identity as a nationality that they feel that, that, that you shouldn't want to restart from scratch, that it will be going back and starting from zero, but we've already made progress, right? That's the perspective. Mm -hmm. Like, you know, so, and how do you feel about the situation? I mean, there are, I don't think we've even covered all the grounds for despair. If you wanted to despair about it, I mean, because it isn't just, Trump, uh, you know, the, the Israeli government has been moving to the right for some time, yeah. I'd say. And the sense is that I that I get is that um, as unlikely as a two state solution is at this point, if there's anything that's more unlikely, it's the Israeli people deciding that, sure, all the Palestinians in the West Bank um, can vote. Because they feel, I mean, even though they have now kind of cut off Gaza, and I always thought maybe this was some of the motivation for uh, technically ending the occupation in Gaza, even though Israel still, you know, Im imposes a kind of blockade that amounts to a kind of control. But, um, but in any event, Gaza's, uh, even if you take Gaza out and don't imagine the Gazans voting, I still don't see Israel, you know, I I permitting Palestinians to vote, maybe I'm wrong, but, but but I guess my question is, what is your version of the hopeful scenario at this point? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I certainly think. I mean, the first thing to say is that I, I definitely think Palestinians would not accept something that is just for West Bank and not Gaza. Like, okay. I think there is a full like recognition that they are one population, and and 
even though the blockade against Gaza has made it so that families, you know, haven't been able to connect to each other for generations now, it's not for generations, sorry, for many years at this point. What I meant is that there are people who have been born that have never been able to meet with their uncles and aunts and grandmothers. So generationally, families have been torn apart. Um, at the same time, I also see that as one of the biggest challenges for the Palestinians right now, which is to figure out how they um, reconcile the split between Hamas and Fatah leadership. Um, and I think that there is an active conversation. I think the younger generations have um, a much different outlook. And this gives me hope, like in terms of like, what is the hopeful scenario here? I do think that um, what we saw in the Gaza March of Return, to me, even as someone who follows, who knows like the pe that people are active, who has been following activism, I was shocked mm -hmm. that people had it in them the strength after having undergone like the wars that have killed thousands of Palestinians and children, right? In 2014 being the latest one, 2009 before that, like Gaza is like under a serious humanitarian crisis, uh, has been bombarded by Israel, right? Under a very like violent regime by Hamas. Uh, and yet the March of Return was organized, envisioned and orchestrated by Palestinian civil society in Gaza. Mm -hmm. Hamas tried to use it and to kind of like, you know, manipulate it, but, but it's spectacular. Like, I, you know, I'm, I'm very connected. The co-producer of Nile India Uprising, Fadia Bushamala, is one of the people who were very active on the Gaza March of Return. Uh, you know, he is, uh, the sort of example, I think, of many of this young generation of Gazans who, um, you know, just just know what they want, which is actually like a much more pluralistic uh, vision of the future. And actually something that I think the vast majority of Americans would agree with. Right. So they have this connection um, to each other and to knowing what they want uh, and to to what the young generation, in the West Bank want. And by the way, what the Palestinian citizens of Israel want. Right. Which I think is a really interesting uh, development here. You have, but you know, the identity of Palestinian citizens of Israel has evolved to a point now where the vast majority of people of a certain age would never like identify themselves as Arab Israelis, which wasn't the case in the 70s and in the 80s. And so all of those, I think, do, do give me hope. I think this, you know, the you know, the same, the same things that, that I think happen in other places of the world you see happening in Palestinian society where access to information, access to, you know, social media and being able to communicate has created a generation that is actually like a lot more, um, progressive in their view. Um, and, and I think that they are, I, I, I believe that they are capable based on what I saw in the, in the Gaza March of Return, uh, they they have it in them to do something and and i think it's gonna it's obviously gonna be hard uh and it's gonna be challenging but i think that with the right um with the right attention like the level of like i think we need to be you know people outside need to be very always like conscientious about what are we supporting and what we're talking about and what we're paying attention to and if we're giving them if we're giving them more of a platform uh they will be able to to kind of have more of a critical mass in their work. Yeah, I think one other thing going for them in the long run, and maybe only long run, but you know, um, in America, the views of younger Jews are different on balance or on the average from, from views of older Jews. I think um, they are to the left on this mm -hmm. issue. If that persists as they grow up and acquire more influence, that could affect things because America's connection to the Israeli government has always been a very important factor in all of this. And, uh, you know, I think that's one thing the whole Ilhan Omar controversy was, was really about. Mm -hmm. And so that's, you know, there's definitely things changing on that front. Yeah. And I, you know, I think what, what will be important to pay attention to and figure out um, how to, how to handle it is that as, the influence of um, as the influence of younger American Jews who are more progressive grows, the Israeli government 
uh, has been shifting who they rely on in the United States, right, for support. And so they are seeing that. They see the writing on the wall. Uh, and they are becoming more and more connected with the more fundamentalist Christian evangelical groups in the United States mm -hmm. as their primary base of support. Um, and so there comes in groups like uh, the Telos group, which is a group that actually tries to work with young Christian evangelicals mm -hmm. to have a, a more human rights oriented vision for what they want the Middle East to be as opposed to an apocalyptic vision mm -hmm. for what they hope will happen there. Um, and so I think those are those are important things to be watching for how it plays out. And I, and I agree with you. It is we are talking about a long term process still. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, listen. It's a great film. Uh, mm -hmm. It's. Uh, I want to say there's one really interesting aspect, kind of aesthetically, is that for the very early part of the film, you don't have as much footage because you're talking about early in Nyla's life, and you you make use of. I don't want to call it animation because that's that'll be misleading. It's more kind of painterly than that, but it's very it's very beautiful. It's very beautifully mm -hmm. done. Um, and, uh, and so that's the, the, the thing's going to air on Tuesday in New York on the East Coast. I think it's 9 p.m. on PBS. I think that the exact hour may differ in, in other time zones. Yes. Please check your public listings uh, if you're not in New York City because it will be a different time. But Tuesday, March 26th. And thank you, Julia Basha. Is there anywhere you'd recommend people go to see you, anywhere else to see your work, a Twitter handle or any, uh, anything? Yes, uh, our website, justvision.org, uh, is a great place to just, one, uh, see our other films, how you can watch different of our films. Also sign up to our mailing list or follow us on social media um, and keep up with uh, what we're doing and where we're taking our films. Okay. Okay, well, thanks a lot, Julia, and, and congratulations so on the film. Thanks, really appreciate it.